and he was very fortunate in having a story in which he could use all these marvellous fresh faces, these Irishmen, whom we had not seen on the screen in England before, like um, F.J. McCormick, for he instance. He used to see in the Abbey. He struck me as being the greatest actor I've ever seen. Was that, I think it was probably the only film he ever made, was it? He made something else called Hungry Hill, was the one called Hungry Hill? I never yeah. saw it. Mm. And then, poor man, he went back to Dublin and died, and that was the end of him. But he was a lamb. He was lovely. The Irish, they told me when I was sort of concerned about his death, they said that it was almost as if he worried himself to death because the people from the Abbey Theatre, people from Dublin in general, if they came over and worked in England, it was not too good, you know. And uh, they used to pour a certain amount of scorn upon Barry Fitzgerald, you know, when he... Finally, when he came to work in England after leaving the... He was superannuated as a civil servant because when he was at the Abbey, it's a sort of part-time job. It was in those days, at any rate. And when he was superannuated from the civil service, he came and to earn a proper living in England and then to America. And there were a lot of people in Dublin who never quite forgave him for that. And all the good actors, the Abbey actors who came and messed around with our films, um, I think felt rather badly about it. And then from that, that on, the newspapers picked it up, and they tried, they asked me about J. Arthur Rank, and I used to say what I thought, which was that in spite of the fact that they looked upon him as the white-headed boy, I didn't necessarily follow that line of thinking, because I thought that he was just um, a man who was taking an opportunistic line in relation to films and that it did not necessarily mean that he was going to sustain us all, all of us who worked in films for the rest of our lives. What about your last film in, in England? Do you remember The Upturned Glass, which actually appeared in... Well, Boston? The Upturned Glass was an interesting adventure. Uh, it was a sort of adventure, because I had made this Im Im immensely successful film for Sydney Box called The Seventh Fail, vale. and Sydney was crowned some sort of terrific king after he'd made that, because it was so successful, and he was given, eventually, uh, within a short distance of time, he was allowed to become king of Gainsborough Productions for rank. And in the meantime, on, the, on, the, on top of this great success with the Seventh Fail, vale, he knew that he could produce for the rank organization anything he chose to, and he had to line up a program of products. And so he said to me, if there's anything you want to make, by all means, let me know, and we'll just go ahead and make it. So my then wife and I thought about this, and we thought uh, we had thought a great deal about the Brontes. I'm always thinking about the Brontes, I guess, up to this day. And uh, we thought we would do a film about the Bronte, the Bronte family, with particular s emphasis on Branwell. And I was a reasonable a age at that time to play Branwell, so we started writing a story uh, about the Brontes called The Upturned Glass. This was a reference to his drinking habits. Then, to our horror, Warner Brothers came out with an absolutely shocking film about the... Did you ever catch that one? Ida Lupino and Olivia de Havilland. And, but it was a real, real bad one. And then he had killed the Bronte story. And so now we were stuck with the title that we had advertised, The Uptown Glass, and the opportunity to make a film. So my then wife, wife and I just sort of another story. And it has <laughs> nothing to do with the Bronte's, of course. It was just a modern psychological melodrama, which we made. And we did most of the... We did all the writing, I guess, between us. And uh, it was quite successful and quite gratifying. I mean, it wouldn't hold up today if you saw it. You'd think, what a lot of rot that is. But nevertheless, it uh, passed muster at the time. A lot of people gave it good reviews, and it did um, good enough business. One, take one. Yes, please, Brian. That winter, 25 years ago, 
you were quoted as making some blunt remarks about the British cinema. Do you remember what they were? Can I have a mm. slight pause? Cut the How much we got? So I wanted to go back and just do one of them. <coughs> Two, take one. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Why didn't they make more of British films after the war with all the stars they had and the facilities they had? Well, they had a limited number of good directors at the time. It was predictable how many good films there would be in any given year because you knew that Michael Powell and Pressburger would come out with some good ones, uh, a good film, let's say. Um, Gilliatt and Launder, Carol Reed, David, N David Lean, who was not quite such a surefire success as he is now, but nevertheless, uh, you could rely on a, that amount. Possibly Terry Rattigan and Tony Asquith. And that was about it. But you didn't expect any, anything great to come out of um, the people who were making the run-of-the-mill pictures, the ordinary comedies or the ordinary Gainsborough pictures, in fact, the kind that I was involved in. Looking back, the, the, the male stars of the period were, were of a higher quality than the women, who tended to be rather of a piece, the English Rose style. Would you agree to that? Well, I don't think there's ever been quite as many um, interesting f lady film stars, certainly on the British scene, as they have men. I think the same applies today, doesn't it? There are lots of great young men, whereas there are not so many great young women. But at that time, it seemed that they'd... We'll cut it, they'd run yeah. it. Okay. Okay. Three, you take one. There were there were some good British films being made. One or two of which you were in, the Odd Man Out, for example. Yes. Have you recollections of that? Do you remember any of the uh, particular Hollywood people of the time with affection? Or oh, I do, because at the time when I first went there, it was bubbling with fascinating talents. Um, there were lots of leftover Germans, for instance, and. Uh, and um, uh, European movie makers who had been sitting it out in, in Hollywood making movies like Max Ophels, for instance, who was a big cult name nowadays. <coughs> At that time, he was just an unfortunate refugee who tried to make a, a go of it in Hollywood and hadn't and never succeeded in making a successful Hollywood picture, although I liked him very much and he had great style, which he was able to develop when he came back to Europe and made La Ronde and eventually... Um, that damned film, which I didn't like very much, but which the young cine, uh, you know, the Cahiers de Cinema boys and all those young people think is just the last word in movie gang. Um, 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 never mind, forget it. Anyhow, there was him, and then there were great people like Preston Sturgis, who I thought was one of the few veritable geniuses of Hollywood. Can I cut you there? Hmm. Sorry. Okay. Yes. There used to be a, an English colony in Hollywood, also we were always told in the papers. Did you mix much with that more? No because it was, it was almost um, coming apart by the time I arrived. You're referring to the Cherubri Smith? Yeah. Mm -hmm. cricket, cricket style colony, which um, Evelyn Waugh wrote about in The Loved One. Well, The Loved One was about 1946, I suppose, wasn't it? It was just after the war, I think. Mm. Uh, but nevertheless, it was, it was coming apart. There was just a bit of it. There were people who shall be nameless who uh, kind of acted English upper bourgeoisie and put on dinner jackets for dinner and um, all that sort of thing did go on. Not exclusively among the British, but sort of would-be British uh, people. Uh, but I, I didn't come in for much of that. I didn't have many English friends, I don't think. They were mostly these people like... Um, 
Ophuls and Robert Siodmak and, and Preston Sturgis. I never made a picture with him, but we'd been in correspondence. He had asked me to make a picture while I was out in the cold on account of that lawsuit that I mentioned. And so we become, became friends, and I found him a very entertaining man, a wild, fascinating man. Um, Were there any particular Hollywood personalities you remember of the, in the, of the, among the actors? And no, I didn't know many actors very well. Van Heflin we used to see quite a lot of socially, but uh, no, nothing much there. You didn't I lead the, the uh, swimming pool life then? No, we, we, we were into a sort of wealthy suburban life, I suppose. And you'd find yourself, rather to your surprise, having dinner or going to a dinner party at somebody's house like Jack Benny. And we didn't really know him very well, but it was just part of the social level that we were entitled to on account of being in a certain income bracket, I guess. It was very weird. And uh, there was certainly not much change, not a great deal of range to our social life. You didn't at that time want ever to direct yourself? Not direct yourself, but do Well, I've it. never really pushed the directing thing very much. I used to, I did at one time direct some television th things and filmlets when I was in Hollywood. But I was really principally out of boredom and frustration more than anything else that I did that. I've always had a great deal of respect for the leaders of a craft, and I would much rather uh, leave it to the experts rather than meddle myself. I certainly wouldn't want to direct myself if I could possibly avoid it, direct with myself acting, because no matter how trivial the piece of acting that I'm contributing may seem to be, it all takes from me a great deal of concentration, and I know that if I were trying to direct at the same time that the whole thing would end up as a dreadful mess and I would, uh, one or other, or possibly both, would suffer. I directed myself in stage plays occasionally and I found that even there I suffered terribly because I would be thinking of the other people all the time instead of concentrating on what I was trying to do on the stage. <clears throat> okay. Mm -hmm. I'll cut that, please, John.